Thanks, Lucy. I'm really excited tonight to be um, introducing the, the Menopause Society, which we have been talking about. It was an idea I had several years ago, actually, to do a society. And then I wasn't at the right time. I didn't have the right team. And then since Lucy's come on, we've decided to just go for it. I'm quite embarrassed it's got my name on it, but we couldn't think of anything else to call it. And obviously we had to have menopause in the, in the title. Um, as many of you might know, I had no formal menopause training as an undergraduate or a postgraduate. Um, when I did Ogden Gynae, I think I had a, a few hours of just learning about hot flushes, really. I've got a background of hospital medicine, so I'm very interested in the disease preventative effects from good menopause care, which seldom women access, actually. In the UK, it's bad, but in other countries, it's even worse. And I really decided to set up a society so people didn't feel alone. I felt very alone in my self-education, in my training. I've pestered a lot of people over the last few years. I've sat in various clinics and I've learned so much from my patients, actually. As many of you know, I run a private clinic and it's private because we can't find jobs in the NHS. But we see over 3,000 women a month in the clinic and every day we're learning from them. So really, I want to share our experience and knowledge. It's really important that we all work together so that the future health of women really improves. And the only way it improves is if they are able to access the best evidence, advice and treatment for their perimenopause and menopause. So we want to empower healthcare professionals wherever they are, so they have more confidence and knowledge to enable women to receive the choices that they want. And as many of you know, we've also developed the free balance app so women can be empowered with information that's pertinent to them. My idea is that healthcare professionals can also be educated and then the dots can join and the world would be a lot healthier and hopefully a happier place as well. So just for the next slide really, that's okay. So there's some aims here. I'm not going to read them all out, but we want to provide advice and guidance. We've already started with 14 fish to answer some clinical queries. And there's a team of us that are doing that, but we, we're going to expand the team so that people can actually ask some clinical advice rather than having to wait until another meeting. They can, on the tap, have information available for them that, that can be shared so we can all learn from each other. We want to be able to inspire and educate people. So we're going to do regular Q&A sessions because we know that a lot of people have got questions and they don't know how to get them answered. We're also um, going to have some competition to my podcast by creating our own podcast through the society. And we've already done some recordings and um, this is going to be really helpful, I think, for healthcare professionals to stay up to date as well. It's not just about education though, research is really important. We know that research in menopause has fallen off the cliff because people aren't interested and they need to be. So we're going to um, do more re um, research ourselves, but we also want to collaborate with real leaders in um, research and we're already starting to gain some momentum with really exciting projects, which we will share with you in due course. And we want, it to, we want to have a, a, a platform where we can share resources, share knowledge and share our education so that people can come to us and share what they've got as well. And we can share as much as possible to them. So the website's been launched today. Um, as you know, websites develop and improve with time. So this is just the beginning of what we want to do and share with you. So there is a subscription. I just want to um, highlight that this is all done through a not-for-profit company. This is nothing to do with my clinic. My clinic has funded it thus far because it's incredibly in debt. We don't do any work with any pharmaceutical company. We don't endorse any products. What I wanted to do is to make the subscription as cheap as possible. And it's the same price for anyone, depending on, it doesn't matter what background, um, what uh, their job is, whether they're part-time or full-time, we've just done the same for everyone. And so people will be able to have the privilege to join our events for free. So the webinars, the case reviews, the Q&A sessions, we're going to, we're planning on an annual conference as well. Um, we've been working behind the scenes to develop some primary care pathways for the perimenopause and menopause, and these will be available 
through uh, being an associate. Obviously, the podcast, there's a community to answer the clinical questions. Um, and we also have this ability to share research and collaborate. And it's not just in the UK, it's globally as well. And obviously, because we're using 14 fish, you can log the hours that you use for your CPD. So on the website, there are the events that are happening, which are going to be updated, but already we've diarized quite a few events already. And then the community section, I'm hoping some of you might have seen it already, and we've had the most phenomenal feedback. We're very lucky with be, it's been led by Dr. Sarah Baker, one of our doctors, and we've got um, not just doctors, but nurses and um, pharmacists involved with this as well. And if you can tag topics, we can collate information so you can actually look at the library of what other people have asked already and learn from it. And we also can link with resources that are useful, not just for um, for us to, to know the available evidence, but also for uh, patients as well to have downloadable resources as well. And again, everything that's done in here will be linked with your portfolio, which will help with your CPD. So 14 Fish are, have this most amazing ability to log everything that we do. So then when it comes to our appraisals, it's all there ready, it's very easy. So these are some of the resources on the website. We've got a lot for free as well. It's not just about the associates being able to access information. We want to give as much free as possible. Like I say, we've got the treatment pathways and we're also building up a, um, a, a, a library so you can link to, um, to journal articles, but also some posters and um, other useful papers and also some videos and and we also want to share from from you as well so if you want us to add things obviously send them in and we can add them as well so we can really have a massive library of shared resources that are very easy for those of us who are clinicians or those people that just want to know more about the perimenopause and menopause So we're already starting, as I've said, we're linking with quite a few universities, not just in the UK, but abroad, actually, to uh, collaborate and start with some really exciting uh, research questions. I'm, I've, as many of you might know, I've got a pathology and immunology degree as well, and I'm very interested in the pathophysiology behind each desire, but also testosterone, that often neglected hormone in women. Um, so we're linking together researchers, and then we're sharing findings that we have um, across to as many people as possible but again if you've got ideas for research or links then again share with us so we can really network and and, and get as much done in the shorter space of time to, to like I say to really make a difference and put menopause back on the map. So um, I'm really now very excited to introduce to you uh, Jane Simon and Jim and I met at a British Menopause Society conference back in the old days pre-COVID when we were real life people going to real life conferences and he gave the most amazing presentation about progesterone actually and um, it was then that I started to realise how horrible synthetic progestogens are and how amazing natural body identical progesterone and micronized progesterone is. Um, and as you'll hear, Jim has the most amazing way of making very complicated things sound very simple and really unpick and break down the evidence in ways that very few people can do. So I then found him, I sat next to him in the following lecture, and I don't think he listened to any of the lectures because I kept quizzing him and asking him questions because you learn so much more from speaking to people than reading a paper or even a lecture. So I'm, since then I've carried on pestering him and now I pestered him so much that he's agreed to give our opening lecture today. So I'm very grateful, James, today for, for your time. Obviously it's earlier for him, he's in Washington and he's given up his lunch hour to um, come and talk to us and really set the scene. And I'm hoping that a lot of you have listened to his amazing lecture already that's freely available on the 14 Fish website. But when you hear some of the information James is going to tell you, I think you'll end up being as cross and frustrated as I am in the absolute injustice to women that's happening because women are not allowed their own hormones back far too frequently. 
not just because they want to feel better, but they want to improve their future health. And we want to reduce the scaremongering that's going on about HRT, not just for women, but for healthcare professionals. So thank you so much, James, and I'm looking forward to listening to what you have to say to us all. Well, thank you. I hope you can hear me. And, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience on this kind of an inaugural uh, uh, leg of the Newsom uh, Menopause Society um, uh, activities. And uh, I recognize that we have a multidisciplinary audience and that it's uh, um, further complicated by individuals across the globe who uh, may not have English as their first language. So I'm gonna try and go through a lot of material, but I'll try and do it slowly and hope that there are uh, adequate time for uh, Q&A at the end. And so I'll begin by sharing my screen and hope that uh, everybody can see my title slide. The title for my lecture today is the Women's Health Initiative or WHI, a focus on hormone therapy, because as you'll see, the Women's Health Initiative was not just about studying hormones in menopause, but the subtitle of my lecture is lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I think you'll understand the subtitle when I'm through with my lecture, as it is critically important to understanding what we're talking about and what our basic balance is between the risks and benefits of hormone therapy. So uh, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics, uh, written by Mark Twain, uh, who in 1906, in a chapter from his autobiography. I like this uh, uh, from Charles Darwin, and I'm trying to make this a bit more uh, English, British. Um, he said, false facts are highly injurious to the progress of science for they often endure long. And I'll just remind my uh, audience that uh, might be centered around Stratford that it's only uh, an hour and a half to Charles Darwin's house on the M54. So it's nearby. Um, he's one of my favorite uh, scientists. Um, and I like the concept that he is the fifth of six children, which certainly made it important for him to do great work to stand out even amongst his uh, brothers and sisters. I have a uh, special thanks to the individuals listed here. There's a long list of them as each of them have contributed to my understanding of the menopause. And many of them are quite elderly now but the answer is we all learn from each other and learn to contextualize uh, our understanding by the others who can help inform us. So I have a bunch of disclosures of scientific uh, issues, uh, lots of pharmaceutical research and instrument research, but none of these are true conflicts for my discussion today. I'd like to have the following as being my uh, objectives. Hopefully I can reach them. I want to apply relevant data and not media hyperbole to educate both you and uh, patients as to how to guide them through the menopausal hormone therapy decision uh, to get rid of and understand the spin and what we call alternative facts that have led to our perception of the risks and benefits of hormone therapy. And I will call them out, the National Institutes of Health here in the US, the Women's Health Initiative, and the Food and Drug uh, Administration, the regulators of drugs in the US are not immune to spin and alternative facts as they are all to one degree or another political bodies and then I hope everyone will have a better understanding of the risks and benefits of hormone therapy, not what the media has told us, 
not what the NIH, WHI, or FDA have told us, but what the truth is. So let's start out by a very, very brief video, and I hope everyone can hear it. This is from the initial announcement, July 9th, 2002, at the National Press Club of the WHI uh, results. On the morning of July 9th, 2002, the National Institute of Health called a full bone press conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. to make an announcement about the WHI study. Good morning. First, women should not start or continue this therapy to prevent heart disease. The findings show it doesn't work. In fact, the therapy increases the risk for a heart attack or stroke. Additionally, it increases the risk for uh, breast cancer and for blood clots. And then to make sure the word got out, sent experts and officials to hit the morning and evening news circuit. Their message was completely unexpected and was shocking. So on the morning, I'd like to uh, just say that that news conference resulted in a flurry of news reports from all over the world. Um, my favorite actually was from the Financial Times, not exactly your best source of scientific information, but they said study dismissed hormone replacement therapy as clinically useless. I'm not sure that anywhere was uh, the uh, words hormone therapy clinically useless even though I would say the emphasis from the press conference was about risk. Uh, more importantly was the degree to which this message was carried. More than 400 newspaper stories and 2,500 television and radio stories just here in the US, not to mention internationally, and so much so that the Annals of Internal Medicine, a scientific journal in 2004, actually had an article about the press coverage of the Women's Health Initiative, not about the Women's Health Initiative, not about the data, but about the press coverage thereof. So not only did they get a lot of uh, uh, press, but they got scientific press about the press that they got about their press. Who knew? So why the WHI? Well, uh, the real issue here is why did the U.S. spend a billion dollars on one project to study hormone therapy and other important health, health issues in postmenopausal women? And I would argue that that money was actually quite well spent, although I would vociferously argue, as I will in the next 20 minutes or so, about uh, how the results were interpreted. We all know that menopausal women have altered quality of life due to hot flashes or vasomotor symptoms, disturbed sleep, and uh, changes in sexual health and vulvar and vaginal health. And this is not new. I won't speak about these issues, but I will say that hormone therapy is one of the major benefits to each and every one of these uh, clinical endpoints, which if you take care of women who are over the age of 50, or as I do many women with premature ovarian failure, these problems are complex as they affect their, the patient, their loved ones, their intimate partners, et cetera. Not gonna talk about this specifically, but there is a role for hormone therapy in each and every one of these endpoints. However, and this study was specifically chosen for this presentation because it predates the Women's Health Initiative. The data on this slide, and I hope you can see the pointer, uh, shows that more than 57% of US women stopped their hormone therapy prior to the Women's Health Initiative within the first year of its use because they were using it primarily for symptoms and their symptoms got better. 
fewer than 10% used them for as long as five years. And it was in this five year users, the long term users, the majority of whom were surgically menopausal. Um, it was in those women that we saw the long term benefits that were used to justify that billion dollars spent on the Women's Health Initiative. Recognizing that around the world, this is US data, but around the world, the number one killer of women is heart disease. The number one killer of women is heart disease, although many practitioners and patients for certain don't appreciate that fact with breast cancer, at least in the US, accounting for only 4% of deaths where heart disease tenfold greater or 45% of deaths. So the Women's Health Initiative looked at those long-term users and saw that the long-term users of estrogen therapy here in the orange squares or hormone therapy in the blue ovals almost always led to a reduction in the risk of coronary vascular disease or CVD. And those of you who are not familiar with this kind of um, data, I need to take a moment to explain it because we'll see other uh, forest plots, so-called forest plots uh, in this lecture. So a forest plot is a bunch of dots, or in this case, dots and squares, and some measure of spread, some measure of spread. This is the 95% confidence interval from here to here. The 95% confidence interval includes 95% of the people with that response. And we would say that anything is statistically significant if that 95% confidence interval did not, not overlap this vertical line at the relative risk of one. So a relative risk of one is the no, far, no harm, no benefit line. And it indicates that the treatment, in this case, estrogen therapy in the squares and hormone therapy in the circles, neither increased nor decreased the risk or increased the benefit of hormone therapy compared to a placebo group or some kind of matching group. But as you can see in this forest plot, in several studies, for example, this study from 1999, both estrogen therapy and hormone therapy reduced, that is to say, a risk was less than 1.0, reduced the risks of coronary heart disease, suggesting a benefit. And only one study, this one up here from Rosenberg in the hormone therapy group, increased the risk of heart disease coronary heart disease with uh, hormone therapy. And it was not a statistical increase because the confidence interval overlapped this 1.0 line. And I'm gonna come back to this because it's very important. Now, this is another forest plot, different subject. This is estrogen therapy and the risk of breast cancer, breast cancer, in women who were ever users of estrogen therapy or never users of estrogen therapy. And you can see a lot of boxes and their confidence interval. This is the relative risk and confidence interval. And I will dare say that if you really concentrate, maybe squint or put a little Vaseline on your glasses, if you wear glasses, that you will see that some studies show an increase in the relative risk of breast cancer. Some studies show a relative risk decrease in the risk of breast cancer with estrogen therapy. But overall, most of the studies and those represented by these large boxes, the larger the box, the more data in the box, they show that the benefit or the risk is very close to that 1.0 line 
indicating that estrogen therapy had little benefit nor little risk uh, as it related to the risk of breast cancer. And what about breast cancer mortality with hormone therapy? Here the data is a little more clear with all of the boxes lining up to the left or reduced risk of uh, mortality with uh, hormone therapy. And so with those forest plots as a background, let's get into the Women's Health Initiative. The problem with observational studies like those that I showed you for heart disease, breast cancer risk or breast cancer mortality are that they're observational. They are not randomized, prospective, blinded, placebo-controlled clinical trials. And observational studies, all of them, have inherent biases, inherent sources of error. For example, if I'm studying a certain a phenomenon in my office, I'm very likely with my office in downtown Washington, DC to have healthier women who are in the neighborhood or live near my office to be prescribed hormone therapy because healthier women are more likely to attend my clinic than others. Um, or perhaps they are already getting more medical care they're coming for their annual exams or they're coming for a particular problem, they're likely to be healthier, wealthier because they can afford medical care and likely to be taking care of themselves better. So that's one bias or a group of subtle biases that are important in terms of understanding who's in those observational studies. But they're not randomly assigned they're not given a placebo as a control. And so the, all observational studies have these biases and sources of error. Well, the Women's Health Initiative was started in 1991. And in 1991, there are a number of things to bring you down to earth in the UK. So Sir John Major was the prime minister. He uh, was leader of the Conservative Party. He was actually liked better than his Conservative Party counterparts by and large. And he served as prime minister from 1990 to 1997, a time when there was very bad unemployment in the UK with more than 2 million individuals unemployed for the first time in two years and where more than um, the, in the employment uh, issues, manufacturing fell below uh, 5 million employees ever, first time in the UK. I know I love uh, European football or soccer, and Arsenal was the champion of the English League, and Man United won the European Cup, beating out FC Barcelona. I'm sorry for the Spaniards on the call today. Freddie Mercury, the leader of the uh, band Queen, died in his home. Uh, 24 hours after going public that he was suffering with AIDS. And Ed Sheeran, a brilliant young singer-songwriter, was actually born in the year 1991. Well, the Women's Health Initiative was established in that year, started a large number of studies with that billion dollars. And in 2002, the estrogen plus progestin arm of the WHI was stopped. Two years later, the estrogen only arm was stopped. And interestingly, in 2002, the World Health Organization categorized estrogens as carcinogens. Well, if the media, the FDA, the World Health Organization, and the NIH all say that hormones are bad for you, well, it must be true, or at least that's what the top shelf headline would have been. But I want to take exception to a couple of things. And this is from a publication from the American Journal uh, published here, the Annals of Epidemiology. And this is straight out of the WHI playbook. 
the WHI playbook by its nature explained what was being studied and how the outcomes were to be interpreted. And I wanna explain the bigger picture of the WHI because it goes way beyond hormones. The WHI had a postmenopausal hormone therapy group or groups. That's PT, PHT, postmenopausal hormone therapy. We're gonna talk about this study in detail in just a minute. But there was also a DM group, not for diabetes mellitus. This was for dietary modification, a study to see if modifying one's diet could improve long-term health. There was a calcium and vitamin D study, which we're also not gonna talk about today. Very important data on calcium and vitamin D and its impact on uh, bone loss and fractures. And then there was a huge, huge, nearly 100,000 American women in the OS or observational study because it, the WHI, to their credit, wanted to know if previous observational studies agreed with their observational study, um, proving that they knew how to do a study and that up to the date, up to date, observational data was being collected. I want to point out that the only, the only, the only primary outcome for which there was randomization in the postmenopausal hormone therapy study was coronary heart disease. The only one, the only primary outcome for which there was randomization was coronary heart disease. Breast cancer was a secondary outcome, a secondary or safety outcome similar to data we get in observational studies. This is a critical point that everyone on this call needs to understand that breast cancer was a secondary or observational safety outcome, not a primary outcome in the Women's Health Initiative. So the results are well known to you. I won't spend much time on them. This is the estrogen progestin arm primary data, looking at the absolute risks and benefits. They're listed for you here in the absolute risk column per 10,000 women per year and the absolute benefit column per 10,000 women per year. I will mention this nuance at diabetes uh, in both the estrogen progestin data, which is here, and the estrogen only data on the next slide. It came out much later, much later than the primary data on this slide, but I thought it would be important to include it given that diabetes is such an important risk for long-term health. Recognize that coronary heart disease, the primary outcome, coronary heart disease was uh, increased by seven extra cases per 10,000 women per year, as was breast cancer, uh, eight extra cases, strokes, seven extra cases, and 18 extra venous thromboemboli per 10,000 women per year. But there were some pretty big benefits, particularly as it related to fractures and hip fractures, seven fewer colorectal cancers, five fewer hip fractures, and 47 fewer total fractures, 15 fewer cases of diabetes, new onset diabetes. Now, they modified their discussion of this a couple times, and I think it's quite important to recognize the difference between whether or not these were statistically significant or not. The nominal confidence interval for coronary heart disease was 1.0 to 1.54, six extra cases per 10,000 women per year. And statistical gurus, and I would agree with them, would tell you that this is not a statistically significant increase in the risk of coronary heart disease because it touches 1.0. We could say it's almost statistically significant. As it relates to breast cancer, 
We could also say it's almost statistically significant. The confidence interval goes from 1.01 to 1.54. And I would argue and show you that it is not statistically significant because it was not a primary outcome and it needed to be analyzed in this way as an adjusted confidence interval where all the statistical significance goes away because it was a secondary outcome, as I've already mentioned. In terms of estrogen by itself, it had a different pattern of benefits and risks. Five fewer, five fewer cases of heart attacks, seven fewer cases of breast cancer. Yes, that's not a mistake. Seven fewer cases of breast cancer. Fewer hip fractures, fewer fractures, fewer new onset diabetes, but more strokes, more venous thromboemboli, more pulmonary emboli, and one extra colorectal cancer. Completely different pattern that came out two years later, 2004. And I will mention for both these two slides, the average age was about 64 years not your newly menopausal woman with hot flashes, with a range of age 50 to 79, very important. Well, these two studies, the estrogen only arm in 2004 and the estrogen progestin arm in 2002, left all of us not knowing which way was up and which way was down. Don't spend too much time looking at this photograph. It will not help you to feel grounded. So let's look at most of the women we treat, the 50 to 59-year-old woman who comes in with menopausal symptoms, vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, et cetera. And these are the results for her from the WHI, estrogen progestin arm here, estrogen only arm here. And you can see that all of the benefits and here the risks in this mustard color, benefits in blue or teal, uh, the benefits and risks are present, but they're very small. These are the number of cases per 10,000 women per year. Actually, diabetes prevention was the biggest benefit in the estrogen trial, where reduction in fractures was the biggest benefit in the estrogen progestin trial, even in women 50 to 59 years of age. This is a big deal, oftentimes uh, diminished or minimized by the WHI investigators. Let's put this in context. Nearly everyone on this call has a credit card. If you're not financially well off enough to have a credit card, I'm sorry, this is a bad time for you. But the answer is most of us own a credit card and the risk of identity theft, if you own a credit card, is about eight in 10,000. And many of you have a whole wallet full or purse full of credit cards. That is considered minimal risk because you're taking it every day when you take out and swipe, touch, tap, or um, imprint your credit card. Yet that was the average risk of most of the risk issues in the Women's Health Initiative. And those are considered rare risks, rare risk. By definition, our risks where there's between one and nine per 10,000, those were the most commonly reported risks in the Women's Health Initiative. Either way, in the US, women went off their hormones. You heard the head of the WHI, Jacques Rousseau, said, don't start them, don't continue them. And so women went off of them. And these are the women without a uterus. And these are women who had a uterus, largely women on estrogen by itself, largely women on estrogen and progestogen. And the answer is most of the women went off their hormones in the US. And I wanna point out that this is an article by Sprague et al, cause I'm gonna show it to you again in a different format. Sprague et al, 2012. Well, breast cancer is always the elephant in the room 
and what's talked about most. And I wanna just mention breast cancer again. I started out with that. Let's look at breast cancer. And I had to dig pretty hard to find an English tie-in, but in the British Medical Journal in 1944, Sir Alexander Haddow had an article showing that you could treat breast cancer with estrogens. Here's the after treatment with estrogens. Here's the before horrible fungating uh, breast cancer uh, in, this, um, in this woman's right breast. And it got better on estrogens, in this case, sylvesterol. 57, same story from BJ Kennedy and cancer in the US, horrible fungating breast cancer, now largely non-existent with treatment with estrogen. A couple of years later or decades later, still bestrol still being used and demonstrating the responses on metastases. This is a large met to the ribs, two large mets in the ribs and in the lung, uh, which are completely gone after treatment with radiation uh, and hormone therapy, estrogen therapy. But there is one randomized trial, and this is important, from 1981, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And James Ingle in 1981 showed that stilbestrol in a randomized trial with tamoxifen was equally effective. Can I say that again? Equally effective in reducing treatment failures in breast cancer. So stilbestrol was equally as good, diethylstilbestrol, equally as good as tamoxifen in reducing the risk of recurrence in primary treatment of breast cancer. So why is it or how is it that we ended up treating breast cancers with tamoxifen? Might we not have been given a choice, DES or tamoxifen? Well, the answer is the DES group had many more side effects than the tamoxifen group, particularly those that primary care doctors don't like, like vaginal bleeding, which is usually the purview of the gynecologist. Whereas hot flashes are not thought to kill anybody, and certainly vomiting is not good or tolerable to anyone. But it was largely vaginal bleeding that killed the use of diethylstilbestrol for the treatment of primary breast cancer. This idea has not been completely lost. This paper from 2009 demonstrated that use of high doses of estradiol, natural bioidentical estradiol, could be cost-effective treatment for patients with advanced ER-positive breast cancer in order to help them acquire aromatase efficacy if they've developed aromatase resistance. All right. Let's look at risk factors in observational studies. Remember, breast cancer in the Women's Health Initiative was an observational type study, secondary outcome. And here they are pointed out, here's conjugated estrogen, Premarin in the Women's Health Initiative. Here's two different reports, 2002 and 2003, on Premarin and medroxyprogesterone acetate the progestogen used in the WHI. And you can see that these increased the risk of reported breast cancers of about 20%, or with estrogen alone, decreased the risk of breast cancer by about 25%. But in the complicated world we live in, there are many other factors that increase or decrease a woman's risk of breast cancer to a similar degree. I'll point out that grapefruit 
decreases the risk of breast cancer in this study, whereas grapefruit increases the risk of breast cancer in this study to about the same amount as estrogen reduces the risk of breast cancer or estrogen progestin increase the risk of breast cancer. Working the night shift increases the risk of breast cancer more than hormones do. Being a Finnish flight attendant, similarly, antibiotic use, my favorite study, doubles your risk of getting breast cancer and many others. So many things that we do in our lives cause an increased risk of breast cancer. And how many women, women practitioners on this call are women who will give up their glass of wine at night, alcohol, in order to reduce their risk of breast cancer when willy-nilly they've given up on their hormones because the Women's Health Initiative said there was an increased risk of breast cancer. Here's that study on antibiotics. It shows that use of antibiotics not only doubles your risk of getting breast cancer, but it also shows that with increasing use of antibiotics, there's an increased risk of both getting breast cancer and dying from breast cancer. Now, how, and this is published in JAMA 2004 around the same time as the estrogen only arm of the WHI, but got no press coverage. And how many of you on this call think twice about causing someone's breast cancer when you prescribe antibiotics for their third or fourth urinary tract infection? It's not even in the dialogue, but here's the data. So what happened and why am I angry about this? Well, because in the original publication of the world of the Women's Health Initiative Protocol and Analysis Plan, Protocol and Analysis Plan, you know, if you're gonna have a protocol and analysis plan, you damn well better follow the protocol and follow the analysis plan. They said that it would, they would, combine the analysis of the estrogen progestin group and the estrogen only group when in analyzing subjects for the increase, decrease, or any effect of hormones on breast cancer. And they obviously did not do that. They didn't do it. They didn't follow their own instructions. And by virtue of that fact, they were hunting for something that was not part of their primary analysis plan. So let's look at the actual data. I think it will surprise you. This is publication from June of 2003. It's the revised effect of estrogen and progestogen or estrogen and progestin on breast cancer from the Women's Health Initiative. And here's what their conclusions were. Relatively short Relatively short-term, estrogen progestin increases the risk of incident breast cancers. That's what they said, 2003. They said the same thing in 2002. They weren't supposed to analyze it separately, but they came out and said it anyway. So let's see what it was supposed to be. <clears throat> They're reporting the nominal statistic unadjusted for their analysis plan. Total breast cancer, estrogen plus progestin versus placebo, they reported the 24% increase. Whereas the a priori defined statistic from their own analysis plan, which should have been done, showed a change that was not statistically significant. So they, if they had followed their own plan, done the paper the way their plan said, they would have reported that hormone therapy did not statistically increase their risk of breast cancer because I've shown you here the no harm, no foul on, no benefit, no risk line is about halfway between those two data points. 
What about mo mortality going forward? This was 2010. They said estrogen plus progestin was associated with greater breast cancer incidence. Again, again. They keep saying this so people will believe them. And further, you'll notice that the first sentence in the paper, the Women's Health Initiative, WHI, randomized trial. Well, randomized trial, that must be a good study, right? Randomized trial. It was randomized for, can you say it with me? Cardiovascular disease, not what they're reporting here, breast cancer. They showed for women entering the study with no prior use of estrogen plus progestin, the hazard ratio for breast cancer incidence was 1.16, not statistically significant, compared with the hazard ratio of 1.85 for women with a prior use of combined hormone therapy. And then they showed that a prior use of hormone therapy was important, that there was an interaction from prior hormone therapy use. So only then did we start looking for what was going on with prior hormone therapy use and the Women's Health Initiative, because let's imagine we were doing a study on bisphosphonates for osteoporosis and fracture reduction. If we were testing a new bisphosphonate for osteoporosis prevention or fracture reduction, we would disallow, disallow, anyone volunteering to be in our study, if they had ever, and I mean ever used a bisphosphonate before. And that's because the impact of bisphosphonates is thought to be long lasting in the skeleton. So we don't want them in our study if they've already been exposed to a prior bisphosphonate. And I would argue that same thing applies here. Well, the WHI finally came clean in this paper which I would say is buried in Maturitas, although as a European journal, good European menopause journal in 2006. Buried in Maturitas in 2006. Why didn't they publish it in the US? I don't know. Here's what they found. They found that the adjusted confidence interval, or in this case, hazard ratio, when adjusted for age, race, ethnicity, body mass index, physical activity, smoking, alcohol, parity, birth control, family history, blah, 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 blah. When you adjust for all the things they should have adjusted for in their original study, because this was not a randomized trial, they found no risk of hormone therapy. So what the heck happened? Well, if you look at prior use of hormone therapy in women who are just coming into the Women's Health Initiative, by where they were randomized in the trial, remember they were randomized for cardiovascular risk, not for breast cancer, that guarantees just about that they won't be randomized for breast cancer because the risk of cardiovascular disease and the risks of breast cancer are not the same but if you look at invasive breast cancer with no prior hormone use, the panel on the left, you see the two lines, the blue line, estrogen and progestogen, and the placebo line just about line up and track almost identically together, almost identically together. Whereas if you look at invasive breast cancer with participants, with any prior hormone use, these two lines, estrogen and progestogen in the blue, uh, the placebo here in the pink, they track the same for about two and a half years, and then they diverge. Then they diverge, suggesting that estrogen plus progestin increase the risk of breast cancer, when in fact, if you move that line, to the other graph, it tracks exactly the same as the estrogen progestin arm in women with no prior hormone use or the placebo group of women with no prior hormone use. 
The outlier, the one that's different is this placebo group of individuals with prior hormone use. So I would conclude from this that estrogen plus progestogen does not increase the risk of invasive breast cancer, but that being on estrogen plus progestogen and then stopping it prior to enrollment in the WHI lowered your risk of invasive breast cancer. That's what this data says to me, and I think the interpretation is correct. But actually the WHI told us this in 2002. In 2002, in individuals with no prior hormone use, none, no prior hormone use, 12,304 out of the 16,608 in the estrogen progestin arm of the WHI, they had a, a hazard ratio of 1.06, and it was not statistically significant. The confidence interval overlapped one, not statistically significant, and they could have said in individuals with no prior hormone use coming into the WHI, 5.3 years of estrogen and progestogen did not increase the risk of breast cancer. That would have been incredibly reassuring to the millions of women in the US at least who were on hormone therapy at that time. But they chose to report it all together and all the risk, all the risk, can you say it one more time, all the risk came from women who were randomized having been on hormone therapy prior to coming into the study. Now let's look at this association in a different way. You remember Sprague et al. 2012? Well, 22% of women in the US were using hormone therapy prior to the WHI. Here's the 1999-2000 data, 2001-2002 data, about 22% of US women who are menopausal were using um, hormone therapy. And after the WHI in 2002, that data taken from Sprague, I showed it to you before, declined down to about 2010, a 79% decline in the use of hormones, and that was about down to about four and a half to 5% women who are menopausal staying on their hormones. But look at what happened to the incidence of new breast cancers. It went up. Breast cancer incidence in the US went up as is evidenced by these pale blue bars, blue green bars, despite almost an 80% reduction in the use of hormones. So how could it possibly be associated with the use of hormones? Does not make any sense. Doesn't make sense. The WHI also reported on ovarian cancer, a terrible and deadly cancer, not the most common cancer in the US, about 14,000 cases of uh, ovarian cancer in the US a year, but it accounts for a disproportionate number of cancer deaths in the US, particularly compared to breast cancer, where most women do not die from their breast cancer. This was a secondary outcome in the Women's Health Initiative. Again, secondary outcome, ovarian cancer. And they reported on this in 2003. And their conclusions on the incidence of ovarian cancer was this randomized trial, again, randomized trial, not for ovarian cancer risk, it wasn't, it was a randomized trial for cardiovascular risk, but they're trying to add emphasis to the quality of their data by calling it a randomized trial, which it was not. It was not a randomized trial for ovarian cancer, but quote, this randomized trial suggests that continuous combined estrogen plus progestin therapy may increase the risk of ovarian cancer. May increase the risk of ovarian cancer. Well, that's pretty scary. 
Being on your hormones for your hot flash is gonna increase your risk of ovarian cancer. Well, let's look closer. Here's the data. And they said, may increase the risk of ovarian cancer. The adjusted ratio, 1.58, confidence interval was wide. It included one, but they said it could increase the risk of ovarian cancer. Well, may increase, is that like almost increases or almost? Well, you know what they say about almost, it only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. This was egregious, in my opinion, to say that hormone therapy increased the risk of ovarian cancer. And a group of us wrote to the Women's Health Initiative in a letter that said, dear Dr. Anderson and colleagues, we disagree. We said, my interpretation of this data is that neither ovarian cancer nor uterine cancer should be considered when determining a patient's benefit risk ratio for hormone therapy. And they came back to Dr. Yudian, the first author on that paper, and said, we agree. Well, if you agree, then why did your paper say it increases the risk of ovarian cancer? That's not right. The study, which was randomized for cardiovascular disease, and you heard Jacques Rousseau at a press conference, the head of the WHI say it doesn't improve heart attacks or strokes, it actually made them worse. Those are similar to his exact words. And in the publication, this is from 2007, they said for women less than 10 years since menopause, the hazard ratio was 0.76. That's a reduction. Wasn't statistically significant. Again, it overlapped one. And women who initiated hormones closer to menopause tended to have reduced coronary heart disease risk compared to those who had an increase in coronary heart disease risk if they started more distant from menopause. But this trend test did not meet our criterion for statistical significance. Our criterion for statistical significance? Since when do you get to pick your criterion for statistical significance? You told us what it was in your analysis plan. Well, they changed it. They decided they were gonna change it. The initial analysis plan, like most of the statistics, says the statistics undertaken should be at the 0.05 level, P less than 0.05. Everyone on this call has heard about P less than 0.05. They decided to change it for this analysis. They chose it to change it to point, less than 0.01, which made it not statistically significant for those younger women. I would argue this shows bias. It shows an attempt to undermine the benefit of hormone therapy and just as plain wrong. Hormone therapy in the WHI for women less than 10 years since their menopause reduced their risk statistically of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease specifically. So let's get some perspective. Oral hormones versus non-oral hormones. We know that oral hormones increase the risk of anything involving thrombosis, stroke and pulmonary embolism in particular. But transdermal preparations from observational data, not from randomized trials, from large observational trials, including from the UK general practice research database reduces the risks of, at least in Danish women, uh, their risk of a heart attack, in UK women, their risk of a stroke, and in French women, their risk of a venous thromboembolism or venous thromboemboli, including pulmonary embolisms. But these are observational data. We took observational data and published a paper called, What if the Women's Health Initiative had used transdermal estradiol and oral progesterone instead? And the answer is, it wouldn't have shown an increased risk of anything thrombotic, and it wouldn't have shown a, an increased risk of anything breast cancer. But those were not chosen for the actual WHI. Transdermal hormones show less 
increase in weight and less risk of thrombosis. So let's get a little more perspective. Let's look at breast cancer and fracture. Here's data from the Women's Health Initiative, estrogen only arm, the first column, and the Ruth trial, a prospective randomized trial of women using raloxifene to prevent heart disease. Raloxifene to prevent heart disease, estrogen to prevent heart disease. The women were approximately the same age. The Ruth participants were a little older, 67 and a half versus 63 and a half years. They were on their hormones a little shorter, 5.6 years compared to 6.8 years. But look, the risk of breast cancer were equally reduced, minus eight cases per 10,000 women per year and fractures were more significantly reduced in an unselected group of individuals in the Women's Health Initiative estrogen only arm. Yet, at least in the US, raloxifene is approved by the FDA to reduce the risk of breast cancer and reduce osteoporosis and fractures. Not so for conjugated equine estrogen. What about progestogens? I already alluded to this fact, but this is observational from a large French and Belgian study showing that micronized progesterone has no risk, no increased risk for breast cancer. Those of you in the UK that have didrogesterone, also no increase, no statistically significant increase in breast cancer in this large observational cohort of more than 80,000 French and Belgian women, mostly school teachers, whereas other synthetic progestogens did increase the risk of breast cancer. Don't forget women's vaginas. They're important. They're not only a sexual organ, but they prevent the urethra and ascending urinary tract infections. We need to keep the vagina acidic and healthy for all of those indications. And it's not only the vagina per se, it's the distal urethra, perineum, and trigone of the bladder, all with estrogen receptors. We want to prevent vaginal atrophy and its adverse effects. And we want to effectively allow women to make choices about being sexually active or not, not force them to make those decisions based on what their bodies can and cannot do. But more than that, the prevalence of vulvovaginal atrophy is also a risk factor for depression and anxiety. A risk factor for depression and anxiety, which is an important issue in postmenopausal women's health just generally. But what happened after the Women's Health Initiative in July 2002 was that the FDA, at least in this country, changed its labeling for hormone therapy to reflect the results of the systemic use of hormones, even though it was applied to the local vaginal use of hormones. And in that label, it says that low dose vaginal estrogen tablets, which you also have mostly worldwide. In our labeling, it says they cause endometrial cancer, they increase the risk of venous thromboembolism, they increase the risk of dementia, they increase the risks of stroke, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, heart attack, breast cancer, et cetera, none of which have ever been shown. Those came directly from the Women's Health Initiative data I have shown you in this lecture, but are now being applied to low-dose local vaginal estrogens. We wrote a letter as the Menopause Society to get them to change it. 18 months later, they wrote us and said no. But the Women's Health Initiative observational study, which I've already pointed out to you, in December of 2018, provided us with excellent observational data showing that none of that information in the label was true. This is observational data for the more than 
3,000 women using vaginal estrogen without a hysterectomy in the observational studies of more than 32,000 women in the observational study of the Women's Health Initiative and showed demonstrated convincingly no increase in breast cancer risk, heart disease risk, stroke risk, hip fracture risk, or endometrial cancer risk, even though there was a slight increase in the point estimate for endometrial cancer, this was not statistically significant. Very reassuring. We are still stuck with the labeling for low-dose vaginal estrogens, which I've mentioned to you. So in summary, I'd like to show you that even the WHI can evolve. This is direct quotes from their publication in July of 2002, in which they note the substantial risks of cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. The substantial risks for cardiovascular disease and breast cancer, July 2002. Less than a year later, or about a year later, they changed that language to the suggestion of a slight overall increase in the risk of coronary heart disease. A slight overall increase in the risk. 2007, they said, with no apparent increase in coronary heart disease risk for women close to menopause. Well, close to menopause is women under 60 or women who had their surgical menopause less than 10 years ago. And they further went on to say, with total mortality being reduced among women aged 50 to 59 years of age. That's only a few years after they said substantial risk of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer. For women on estrogen alone in 2016, they said estrogen alone significantly reduced breast cancer incidence in postmenopausal black women with no adverse influence on coronary heart disease, venous thromboembolism, or all-cause mortality. Well, that's pretty good, 2017. And further, 2017, for the combined estrogen only and estrogen progestin, they said was not associated with a risk of all-cause, cardiovascular, or cancer mortality during a cumulative follow-up of 18 years. Unfortunately, as I showed you in those two Sprague slide, being off hormones among hysterectomized women led to an increase in, I would argue, unnecessary deaths in women post-hysterectomy. Through 2011, almost 50,000 women died prematurely from not being on their hormones but having had a hysterectomy in their 50s, 50 to 59 years of age. Just recently, this publication from 2020 from Women's Health Initiative demonstrated that because women didn't go on hormones, there was an excess incidence of both diseases, coronary heart disease, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, hip fracture, and stroke that cost the U.S. economy more than $4.1 billion. And in the aftermath of the Women's Health Initiative, two studies, 2009 and 2011, showed documented increases in the risks of uh, fracture and specifically hip fracture. But one of my favorite slides is this one, looking at a group of time frame, a group time frame from before to after the Women's Health Initiative and comparing men in the upper panel to women in the lower panel, demonstrating that be from before the Women's Health Initiative through and until after the Women's Health Initiative, men's health, generally improved. Blue is substantial improvement, gray minimal improvement. Only a few places in the US 
where men's health got worse. But if you look at the same time periods from before the Women's Health Initiative to after the Women's Health Initiative, look at the amount of red on the US map showing women's general health got worse. Women's health got worse. What happened? Well, we had the Women's Health Initiative and it would be my argument, not proven, cannot be proven, that women went off their hormones and in particular, surgically menopausal women went off their hormones and made their health worse. But it's not the only, the Women's Health Initiative where conflicts of interest are present or where we have lots of changes in order to have self-serving outcomes. These are uniform and I won't take you through these references, but they're highly prevalent in the US and ex-US and where spin or changing of specific data to suit the authors uh, and to misread or misrepresent the findings are prevalent. And they're included here in a table showing the highest prevalence of SPIN is based in publicly funded research, not industry funded research, not multiple industry funded research, not private research, but in publicly funded research where 58% of the time, these authors found specific strategies uh, to highlight experimental results that did not match what the true findings were in the study. And with that, I'll leave you with this. So when your menopausal patients get mixed signals about hormone therapy, they're not the only ones. These are three press reports from the same time period reporting on three years after stopping the randomized treatment arm in the WHI, when the Wall Street Journal, a very good US newspaper, said cancer risk rises slightly after hormone therapy ends. The New York Times, a broadly read international newspaper said, slight cancer risk remains after hormone therapy stops. We can have that as a horizontal arrow. And the Chicago Tribune, a very good paper in, from Chicago, at the same time, these are all March 5th, 2008 reports, said hormone therapy risks lessen after time. So we have increases, decreases, and stay the same, all in the same news report, on the same article, in the same day. So in conclusion, an increased risk of breast cancer detection is not the same as breast cancer mortality or breast cancer causality. Compared with placebo, the risks associated with hormone therapy in early menopausal women are either not statistically significant or rare, or rare meaning less than one in a thousand, and even more rare in women less than age 60 or less than 10 years since their last menstrual period. The magnitude and type of risks associated with hormone therapy are less than or similar to other commonly used medications, supplements, and therapies, including antibiotics, Hormone therapy reduces all cause mortality, heart attacks, fractures, and new onset diabetes, and thus the benefits far outweigh the risks in early menopausal women. And hormone therapy is the only therapy that can reduce fractures in an unselected group of women without being selected for even having osteoporosis or prior fractures. And that doesn't even mention uh, what the benefits are for symptoms, vulvovaginal atrophy, sleep disturbance, and vasomotor symptoms. So I'll leave you with this quote from Max Planck. A scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up 
that is familiar with it. Thank you very much. And I hope I haven't run too long and have a little time for questions and answers. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today and thank Dr. Newsom and all of her colleagues for this generous invitation. Thank you so much. That's just brilliant, but really depressing, absolutely shocking, and just a car crash for women, isn't it? And you know, the more I read the studies, the more I listen, the more I learn, the more frustrated I get, actually, because. This isn't just about women suffering with symptoms. This is about women suffering with their future health and misinformation. And I'm really disappointed every week I get letters from healthcare professionals complaining about my clinic, saying, what are you doing? How dare you give HRT? And I think there's so much that's been fantastic in your lecture and I've really appreciated it. One of the things that you said, which resonates so much is about choice actually, about women wanting to have or women being allowed to have. And I think this is key in anything in medicine. So even if you presented data today to really show that HRT was as bad as the worst person who thinks it is, actually, I still think women are allowed a choice. But what you're telling us all by showing us the data in very clear ways is that actually HRT is very safe and women's lives and future health is at risk by being denied HRT. Isn't that right? Correct. And in the US, we call it shared decision making. And so I believe that women should have control of their own bodies in many, many different medical ways. And given the proper information on risk, even if it's distorted risk, those women should be able to make their own decisions about benefits and risks for them, not for some imaginary person or some much older woman who has studied in the Women's Health Initiative and the risks she contributed to those outcomes. Absolutely, and, and certainly NICE, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence guidance, um, as, you, as you know, they produced guidance in um, June of last year, the Shared Decision-Making Guidance. And there's a lot of talk over here, certainly some of the high-level work I'm doing with NHS England about the percentage of women that should or shouldn't be on HRT. And I actually think that's an academic discussion or a nebulous discussion, really, because it's more about, I think, 100% of women who want HRT should be allowed to have it, regardless of... Um, who they are, what they are, what the history is, because it's about choice based on the right information, which is crucial for us as healthcare professionals to impart. So um, I know there's a lot of people out there who've been getting quite a few messages personally going, my goodness, this is amazing. I need to listen again, listen in slow motion, because for a lot of people, you're presenting data in ways that they've not heard before because they've been given the bad things about HRT. Um, and so it's very hard to unpick evidence, isn't it? And also to unlearn what you know already. Um, so there are a few questions that are a bit more specific, if you don't mind sort of answering them, if that's okay. So I, I don't mind at all. And um, this will be, uh, this lecture will be on your website. Yeah. And, uh, and so people should be encouraged to uh, listen again. Mm -hmm stop and start it, go over it. If I wasn't clear, if I stuttered, or if they wanna just look at the slides, look at the slides, think about it. Um, it is a lot of information and uh, I didn't talk about any, much of the benefits, but uh, just about the risks. Yeah, but I think you spoke enough about the benefits for us to really focus on, you know, I'm a physician, as you know, I'm not a gynecologist, but I'm, you know, it's something that reduces risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. You've already explained that cardiovascular disease is a common cause of death in women, actually. There's a lot of women who die with breast cancer, not from breast cancer as well, as, as we know. So, you know, but it's, it's looking at that data and just being sure that it's right, um, we, we present it right to women. And I think, you know, this is a big study with big numbers. And when you look at statistically significant or not, I mean, it's mind blowing, actually, how it's really important to look at the original sources of information and not get it from our local newspapers or even some of the medical journals as well. So 
So there's just a few questions I'm just going to read through. Um, actually, it's very interesting, isn't it? So I obviously got a menopause clinic, but actually it's more of a perimenopause than menopause clinic as well. And, you know, I personally didn't realise I was perimenopausal until a few years after I'd been experiencing symptoms that came on very gradually. But for six months, I was really struggling and very close to giving up my job because my brain had gone and no one told me that I was perimenopausal. I haven't diagnosed myself, which is very embarrassing. But um, how do we know, like someone was saying, um, one of the questions, 43-year-old, perimenopausal, lady said to this, this person in clinic, how do you know when the right time or the safest time is or the best time to start HRT? And there's no test, we know that. Um, and sometimes it's retrospectively. I know that how I feel now. I wish I'd started it 10 years earlier, not five years earlier, but I can't put the clock back. So is there, a, is there something that you would say to, to women about starting HRT or how to know? So <clears throat> there is no real good way to know where a woman is in this ever-changing uh, reproductive part of the life cycle. Is she fertile at 45? Does she need contraception? Are her heavy periods that are somewhat irregular in need of treatment? Does she have underlying diseases that or disorders that are becoming more prominent that need treatment independent of her hormones or cycles? Or is she having intermittent menopausal symptoms like hot flashes or night sweats or disturbed sleep that are reproducible always right at mid-cycle or always right when she's on her period <clears throat> or some other time? Um, it's very difficult to know, but I would say that both supplemental estrogen in women who are uh, menstruating and having symptoms can reduce or eliminate those symptoms. Or if control of the cycle is important for either bleeding or premenstrual symptoms, or so that woman can have contraception and be secure in having sex without concern about getting pregnant, uh, because either she doesn't want any more children or most of her children are now teenagers and she hasn't been in uh, what you call nappies for, uh, for uh, decades, um, the answer is a con combined hormonal contraceptive might be good for her. So individual decision making, depending upon what the goals are, very, very difficult to know where she is in that transition. If she ends up on birth control pills, she can continue them uh, for many years, as long as she's doing well, and then change over from birth control to uh, hormonal uh, therapy in menopause once she's uh, made the transition. Yeah, absolutely. I think individualization is so important and looking at other risk factors, like you say, looking at contraceptive needs is really important. And um, um, we, we now certainly in our clinic we use so much more, well, we mainly use transdermal estrogen because of the, the no, being no VTE risk, even in women who have a personal um, risk or a family risk of, of clot. Um, and so um, we also use different doses depending on people's requirements. And certainly there are some people um, in the UK, but probably abroad as well, who get very scared about high doses of estrogen. And we um, certainly, I saw a lady in my clinic today, she's 41, fit and well, but she's on double the maximum licensed dose of estrogen. And every time she sees to a doctor, he, she says it must be reduced because it's too dangerous. This is a lady who's had a hysterectomy, surgical menopause, young. I'm very worried about her bones, heart, brain. So I'm giving her physiological levels and she's been told to come down. And I'd just be really keen to hear what you think because it is something that causes a lot of worry over here. Yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the problems is that our definitions and our discussion and our language about physiologic levels, high dose, medium dose, low dose, compared to what? We don't discuss them compared to what? So let's just talk about a few facts. These are real facts. So a normal menstruating woman, a normal menstruating woman 
has different blood levels of estradiol, depending upon whether it's her first day of bleeding or the day before she bleeds the next cycle. And it fluctuates, it's all over the place, depending upon how she's ovulating, when she's ovulating, et cetera. But if you take a large number of women and you draw their blood every single day of a menstrual cycle and you average it all together, the average estradiol level in blood in the average day of an average menstrual cycle is somewhere between 100 and 120 peak grams per milliliter. That's a fact. It's also a fact that we almost never give that much estrogen to women for menopausal therapy because it's actually difficult to get that much estrogen into them. And their insurance won't, co won't cover that much hormone treatment. So it's very rare that we bring their blood levels up that high. So the discussion of low, middle, and high dose replacement compared to what they had in your case uh, your patient before her hysterectomy uh, is really moot. She used to have much more herself. Absolutely. And, and I think the other thing is we do know, don't we, that women who still have symptoms have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis, which is what we're trying to prevent often by giving HRT. So I think um, it's very reassuring to hear that you say that as well. There's also... Um, quite a few people that we see and speak to who have been denied HRT, as we know, and now they're waking up realizing that they want to protect their bone, brain and, and heart, but they're more than 10 years after the menopause. They've, this so-called window opportunity has gone for them. Um, I certainly feel quite reassured by giving older people HRT, especially when it's transdermal, because I think the biological effects are quite different to oral estrogen. Um, but I'd be really keen to hear, because I know a couple of people have asked that question, if that's right. Yeah, so th this is actually a very important and difficult question to answer. Because one of the things I didn't discuss, but in the 2007 publication where they combined the estrogen and the estrogen progestin arm, and they looked at the individuals most likely to have events, heart attacks and strokes. They found it was those women who started on their hormones, either estrogen alone or estrogen and progestogen, when they still had persistent symptoms and they were outside this window we've been talking about 10 years from their last menstrual period or from their hysterectomy, oophorectomy surgery. So the women we want to treat that need the treatment were in fact the ones that had the mo were most likely to have events. That says to me, as you just noted, that cardiovascular disease is an underlying complication or effect in women that have persistent symptoms. So on the one hand, I don't think that there is a window for bones. I don't think there really is a window for brain, except if we trigger a stroke, which would be very unlikely with transdermal estrogens. But I do think this data from the Women's Health Initiative, even though it was oral estrogen, gives me pause. And what does that mean? That means that I at least step back and do what you and your clinic and colleagues do much better than I do, Louise, and that is do a current cardiovascular risk assessment. In the US, we're all about tech and cost, high tech, high cost. In the UK, they're much more about what's on the NHS and what's lower tech and lower cost. But for example, a coronary artery calcium score a lipid profile with an assessment of some of the more atherogenic particles that might be otherwise risk factors for events that are not assumed. For example, LP little a uh, in a lipoprotein profile or uh, an, a, a 
uh, intima media thickness by ultrasound, some assessment of that woman's current risk of an event tends to help me say, well, Mrs. Smith, you're probably better not on hormones versus Mrs. Jones, your coronaries are clean as can be, your cholesterol profile's fantastic, you're a good candidate for whatever you wanna do. And those yeah. women might be very different and sometimes they're very difficult to separate. Yeah, and I think that goes back to individualization as well and sharing uncertainty. Certainly we share a lot of uncertainty with our patients as well. Um, and probably the benefits are still going to outweigh the risk, but we haven't got the studies and, and therefore we are going more on, on hunch and looking at the overall picture as well. There's, there's a couple of people who have been asking about women who have a family history of breast cancer. Um, because there's a lot of these women are sadly told they can't have HRT. And, you know, a lot of these women have BRCA gene or they have, uh, you know, other reasons, genetic reasons why they have an increased risk of breast cancer. So they have an increased risk anyway, but giving them HRT, especially estrogen, you've already said is going to lower their risk. Is that the same in women who've had breast cancer? Do you mind just confirming? So yeah, if they have a, a, family, history, a family history of breast cancer, yeah. So if women have a family of history of breast cancer, I think the question is slightly different sometimes, but it's an important distinction. I think the, the question is, do they have a family history and an inherited factor, which makes their risk very high, for example, BRCA1 or BRCA2, and now we have a whole litany of those factors. They may have a family history and they may be candidates for breast cancer risk reduction surgery. That's, a diff, that's one subgroup. Then there are those that have a more distant relative or maybe a first degree relative, but just one family relative with breast cancer. And for them, the question is, should we be trying to reduce your risk of breast cancer using medication? Or are your symptoms justifying giving you hormone therapy, which we can share decision-making on in terms of your risk, or something else? We shouldn't forget that we have drugs and surgical approaches to reducing breast cancer risk, depending on what's necessary and or sufficient for that woman. If she has a genetic type of increased risk for breast cancer and has her breasts surgically removed, she remains capable of being on full hormone therapy because the assumption is, and it's a good assumption, that she does not have residual breast cancer or breast cancer risk. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly, certainly there are quite a few women that have um, a, a risk reducing mastectomy, but then there are others that have um, increased risk, but we would, we would still usually give them HRT because of their benefits. So we see a lot of women who have risk reducing oophorectomies that are denied HRT um, and everyone, gets confused, or not everyone, but a lot of people get confused that they're removing their ovaries because they're risk of ovarian cancer, not because they don't want them to have estrogen. Um, and so there, I saw a woman who's recently in my clinic who becomes suicidal and um, with, with awful crippling anxiety, low mood related to her, but came on after her oophorectomy that she had because she had a family history of ovarian cancer and she was denied HRT until she couldn't have it. And it's been a real struggle to even get her to start taking her hormones because she's grown up thinking hormones are the devil and have caused her mother's um, ovarian cancer, but she's finally starting to improve with the HRT. But it's hard for these women when they're told different things. Very, very, very difficult to tease it apart. So, <clears throat> um, women who have oophorectomies at any age have also been uh, had their uh, testosterone, primary source of testosterone removed. And they may be on good solid doses of estrogen, but non-responsive 
in terms of their spontaneous sexual thoughts, fantasies, arousal, orgasmic response, etc. So next time I come, Louise, we'll just have to talk about testosterone. Absolutely. There is a question about that. And there is a webinar that we did before actually with one of our doctors about testosterone, but we need to keep this conversation open because we produce more testosterone than estrogen, as you know, before the menopause. So for us women, we really can quite often miss it. Um, and it's crucial that we consider testosterone. And certainly a lot of women we see who have quite severe psychological impact of their perimenopause or menopause. As you say, you give all the estrogen you like, but it's not until they have testosterone often, their brain starts to work in a different way. And not just for sexual function, but actually just for their brain to connect, their memory to come back, their stamina, their concentration. And it's really difficult, as you know, not just in the UK, but in the US for women to obtain this sort of hormone. So we need to keep that conversation going. Yeah, I, I actually did a study showing that giving testosterone to those women improved math problem solving and visual spatial function. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, as you say, it's um, prevalent in women of all ages. It's lost when the ovaries are removed um, or by age 60 plus. And uh, testosterone has a lot of uh, important effects, positive effects in women, uh, not only in terms of sex, mood, energy, strength, cognitive function, lean muscle, there's a lot. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and I think that you mentioned quite rightly, obviously, about considering the oral contraceptive pill for some women, it can affect their sex hormone binding globulin, so their free testosterone can go. So, um, and also there isn't quite enough, as much evidence for bone and heart protection in the synthetic pill. So it, it is this, when we try and push people over to HRT sooner, maybe with a marina coil, um, um, or if they need contraception as well. Um, there's certainly a move to have the female testosterone and from license over here, hopefully this, this year in the UK, which would be amazing. I think you're a bit further behind, but it would be incredible, wouldn't it, if all women who wanted their own hormones, estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, were unable to have them, the world would look very different, wouldn't it? You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> so um, some of these questions we've sort of answered, Lucy. I'm just wanting to take, make sure that I haven't missed. So someone was asking about perimenopause. We see a lot of women who their periods haven't really changed in frequency, maybe slightly heavier, slightly lighter. They're, they're more, I would say, testosterone deficient than estrogen. They're deficient. They're, they're really struggling with their stamina, their mood, their libido, um, and their, their memory. And we give them a bit of estrogen, often testosterone, but some of these women know they're progesterone intolerant. They might have had PMS. They might have had synthetic progesterones. So quite often I will give like the good bits first, if you like, for two or three months. See how they get on and then add progesterone, certainly when their periods start changing, because my feeling is they, they've got their own progesterone because they're having periods. Um, I would never give estrogen only uh, for women that don't have their, um, um, who have still got their womb, who haven't got periods. But the first two or three months, I think that's quite safe. But I don't know what you think, because someone was asking that. Yeah, so <clears throat> I've been doing that for years and years and years. <clears throat> it, um, it requires confidence in that patient. Uh, the way I do it is that I give them uh, transdermal estradiol, as I suspect you do as well. And with a very clear documentation that if they stop their periods, which I agree is stopping their own endogenous progesterone. If they stop their periods for three months at a time, 90 days, they give me a call and we give them a withdrawal bleed. Yeah. And we'll do that frequently uh, until they've had four 90 day withdrawal bleeds, artificial periods, and then we'll get them in to talk about menopause because then they haven't had a spontaneous menstrual cycle and they're officially menopausal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it requires a adherent patient and one willing to go the extra mile to contact my office to be safe, to be yeah. extra safe. 
Yeah, which is really reassuring because certainly we do that. And I often only prescribe three months of estrogen. So I, it's not on a repeat prescription. I know they can't get it. I'm very clear in the letter. And for some, it's, again, it's about sharing the decision making. I wouldn't do it with everyone, but a lot of these women are very keen not to have progesterone initially. And I think that's fine. Also, those women who are very low with their mood, um, they know that the progesterone will drop it. Whereas if they come from a higher place, dropping their mood is not going to become, they're not going to lead to become suicidal. If I'm worried about them, I just want to get their mental health so much better before worrying about their endometrium. <laughs> three months is not going to cause any harm. Yeah, I, th I think that's in incredibly important for any of the uh, generalist primary care docs, et cetera, on this call. Uh, there's this horrible fear of postmenopausal bleeding. Mm. There's a over fear of endometrial cancer. And as long as that woman has a near normal body weight, doesn't have to be normal, just anything near normal, and has not had amenorrhea for a long period of time, it's unlikely that she will have endometrial cancer, even though she has, she may have endometrial hyperplasia, which is easily reversed with progesterone. Mm. Yeah, I think it's very important. There's um, a bit of a move for some people over here, especially gynecologists, if we're increasing the estrogen dose, they say we need to increase the progesterone dose, whereas we often need to increase the dose just to increase the absorption into that woman. They're on a standard dose of utradestam, for example, 100 milligrams, they never get bleeding. And if they're not bleeding, I'm actually not worried about them, regardless of their dose of estrogen. Um, and, and women are very... Um, very clever uh, obviously they're very clever but they'll tell us if they have any bleeding they will report it to us and then we'll do the appropriate investigation so yeah very very important that women take control of this part of their uh, postmenopausal or perimenopausal lives um, I don't think I have difficulty convincing them to do that they remember that what was normal for them was regular menstruation and even though they're not going to have regular menstruation in menopause, they know once they're menopausal, they're not supposed to be bleeding. And when they do, then they're very apt to report it and allow me to investigate. Absolutely, which is really reassuring to hear from you. Um, we, you, met, you touched on urogenital syndrome uh, or urogenital symptoms, which is so important. And so neglected in women often as they age as well we know how common it is and we see or I certainly see a lot of women who really struggle sitting down for long periods they struggle wearing underclothes you know sex is something they've not had for a very long time and um, we also know that HRT can improve these symptoms but a lot of women I mean I've read about a fifth of women which which reflects my clinical practice as well need localized hormonal treatment as and systemic HRT don't they to really get on top of those symptoms yeah so um I think your judgment that about 20 percent of women need local in addition to adequate systemic levels of hormones is correct I have seen that in print both with and without a reference but the reference that I found for it didn't actually say that um, my impression is, is it's about 20, 25%, but there are clearly some women that do, and uh, insurance companies, other payers, and sometimes the women themselves don't understand why they might need it, but uh, I, I think you're on the right track, and that certainly, that percentage certainly is consistent with my own uh, experience. Yeah, and certainly everyone that's on taking systemic HRT every review I always ask them about not just vaginal dryness or vaginal or vulval symptoms but about urinary symptoms as well so it's very important that we don't forget for the entire woman so I'm, I'm really so grateful Jim for you giving your time which I know you're so busy and just sharing some of your phenomenal brain and knowledge with us it's it's just incredible and I really feel we're just at the tip of the iceberg we're still playing with this and, but we've got 
so much we want to do, but we can only do it with working with fantastic people like you and trying to unite the world and unite women so that we can improve future health. So I'm very grateful and we will be putting the recording on for people to view through the through the website and I'm sure we'll invite you back to do more. So thank you ever so much. And I know everyone watching, it's a shame we're not live um, in real life, but I know everyone is very, very grateful for you giving your time and knowledge. So thank you. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate your attention for allowing me to go over my time. And uh, I wish you and your colleagues tremendous success in the launch of your society. And uh, I'm happy to help uh, going forward and to give another talk if it, it serves everyone's best interests. Thank you. We've recorded that, so no going back. Thanks you ever so much, and thanks every, My pleasure. Ever, so, ever so much everyone who's here joining us tonight. Um, it's a real honour, and I'm very excited to see what we do in the future. So thanks everyone. So we're saying, stay positive, test negative. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Take care now. Be well. Bye now. Bye.